Hi, everybody. Boy, there are a lot of everybody's here, too. This is pretty cool. I remember the first time we did this 18 years ago, and I was there, and there were five of us over at the customs house. And every year it's grown. I missed two. I missed uh, a couple of years ago I was traveling, and in 2003 I had no hair because I was going through chemotherapy, and my doctor said, don't be in crowd. Uh, by the way, I'm fully in remission from cancer, so that's good. Right? <laughs> A lot of you have asked me about that because you knew about it, and, uh, and I appreciate your, your support and your prayers. Yesterday I was interviewed by somebody that said, how have you done your forecasts over the years and how accurate are you? I lied about the accuracy. <laughs> and they said, you know, early on we, we looked at really just one thing, and that was the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And if we were in El Nino, there was a certain signal, and if we were in El Nino, there was a certain signal. Uh, Tyree and Mark have both referred to things like classic El Nino patterns. And, and I think the best, best way to describe it is an El Nino has kind of a double hump with an active early season, kind of a shutdown in the middle of the season, and then an active spring. Last year really was a classic El Nino in a lot of ways. And El Ninos in the Northwest tend to be mild, tend to be on the warm side, and they tend to be dry. Our driest and warmest winters occur during El Ninos. Not every El Nino is warm and dry, but the driest and warmest tend to be. La Ninos tend to have this one big single hump, where things like today, this month, October, tend to be pretty mild, and then once November arrives, things really get cranked up, and we have about four months of relatively active, cool, wet weather. Not every La Nina is that way, but, but most of them tend to be. But then we started noticing that moderate El Ninos and strong El Ninos had a little bit different signal. And moderate and strong La Ninas had a little bit of signal, so all of a sudden we had four combinations. And then some of us started noticing this thing that we now call the PDO. I was one of the people, and I, I had conversations with UW about it, seeing this multi-decadal cycle that really seemed to be prevalent in the Northwest and in fact across the U.S. and in many parts of the world. Um, I should have named it, and I could have. Probably since I was an OSU guy, I would have named it the, the Beaver Oscillation. <laughs> but, then, but then if we talk about the B.O., that might not be the best. <laughs> so the, the UW guys named it PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and it is it stuck. And we noticed that an El Nino during a negative PDO is different than an El Nino during a positive PDO. And La Nina, all of a sudden now we have eight permutations. And then I started looking at sunspot cycles. And pretty soon it got pretty crazy. And it reached its height of craziness in 1997. And I was so confident that, that all these parameters were going to tell me exactly what was going to go on that I decided to go month by month. October, November, December, through. That was, that was a strong El Nino year. And I felt pretty confident about my forecast. And it turns out that I got the year really, really accurately. And I missed every single month. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like this. You know, I said wet and it was dry. I said dry and it was wet. So that was a wake-up call. And little by little, I've kind of reverted back to my old patterns. And now I'm, I'm more back in looking at ENSO and PDO and, and, and then one other thing is what we call the analog approach. And you're going to hear more about this from Pete. But basically what it means is that history tends to repeat itself. If we have a year that is substantially similar to this year, then it's likely that what we're going to experience from this day forward is similar to what happened in those years. So it's a pattern recognition kind of system that I use. And with that, I will commence and try to figure out the, there. Current conditions, I'll go really quickly because Tyree just showed you quite well what is going on. South America, North America, anomalies, sea surface temperature anomalies, colder than average here, strong, relatively strong La Nina going on. Um, this is the Southern Oscillation Index from, uh, I think it was, it was Steve Pierce who first told me about the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. I, uh, no offense. Kyrie and Noah, but uh, I really like their ENSO page a lot. And, and we were in an El Nino last year in, in negative SOI, and then look, look what happened in 
in the spring. It just jumped like crazy, and now we're up in strong La Nina category. Not only at the surface, but at the subsurface. This is another thing we look at, because sometimes the, the sea surface temperatures will fool you, but there is a lot of very cold water at depth. This is September. Really cold anomalies from the South American coast out to about the dateline, beyond the dateline. So this is a full-fledged real deal. Um, talk a little bit about these, the multivariate ENSO index, which I really like. Klaus Volter of, uh, from Boulder from NOAA developed this technique. Rather than using the simple SOI, it's a multivariate index. And, and the, the, the blues are, uh, are La Nina events. And you can see the 50s, 60s, early 70s had a lot more blue than red. Uh, the mid-70s to the late 90s had a lot more red than blue. And since uh, the mid-90s, we've been kind of kind of equal. But, but look at the spike right here for this year. It really, really dropped quickly. And then at the bottom is the PDO index back to 1900. Again, you see the, the periods like this period with mostly El Ninos in the 20s, 30s, and early 40s. And oh, by the way, there was, I, I'm not supposed to say global warming, but there was that. <laughs> During that period. And things, I, I can say global cooling though, can I? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, a, a, a quasi uh, 50 year cycle that goes on, and I think we're back in, in the, uh, the mostly blue for the next 20 years or so, but we'll see. 20 years. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh, this is such a busy graph. I don't think I want to show that. Show that. <laughs> that was that was Klaus Walters, and this is mine. Here's what I did, and 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 I, I've got to say, Pete Parsons is back here, and he has a way of looking at years and comparing them. And quite frankly, I started copying the way Pete does it. So, Pete. <laughs> Kudos to you, brother. Um, what, what this does is it, this is looking at the uh, multivariate ENSO index uh, back to the first of the year, December, January. And, and, I, and I went through and I, and I used a pretty simple correlation coefficient and, and I found years that had the same shape of the curve and about the same average as this year. And so this is part of the analog system. This year is this dark blue right here. We were in a, a weak to moderate El Nino, and then we were now down into a full-fledged La Nina. And those are the other years that, that really match the best. Um, and, and the two best matches really are, are these two right here, uh, 1988 and 1973. 73, the winter of 73, 74 came up a bunch in my analysis. But they have very similar shapes. So the idea here, of course, is that if, if this, is, this happened in those years, and, and this matches those years, and it's likely that these conditions would be repeated. This is the, uh, the years with the lowest MEI value since 1950, and right now, for uh, for August September, we're the lowest. Of, excuse me, of all those years, uh, 75 appears in this as a pretty good match, and, uh, and so does 55. Although 55 didn't drop as far. And uh, then the PDO matches, oh, these are, these are getting crazy. Um, I'm going to just skip that and, and just, just, just tell you what it says. In terms of PDO conditions, uh, the, the best matches were, were those years right there, 60, 61, 70, 94, 2001, and 2006, with 1970, probably the best. The MEI matches were 70, 73, 78, and 2007, and I like 73 the best and the, and the closest there. Not just in terms of the MEI and PDO, but when I go back and look at some of the spatial maps, the conditions were similar as well. So based on this analog approach, I think the, uh, the best matches were 1970-71 and 1973-74. Now, what were those years like? Well, here's snowfall, cumulative snowfall. So this is month by month just adding up the total snowfall of government camp about 4,000 feet for, for the whole season. This, this dark blue line is the, the normal or the average climatology. And then those are the four best analog years. And 77 through were the best. 1960 and 1988 were okay, but not quite as closely matched. 
If you look at the two best analog years, they're very similar in terms of snowfall and they're well above average. For the, for the whole season, 73, 74, I had about 475 inches, whereas the uh, long-term average is about 270. Um, and in fact, every year except 1960-61 was, was above average. But um, this to me makes sense, that, that La Niña's do tend to produce a lot of mountain snow. Um, <coughs> low elevation snow can go either way, and I'm going to totally pass on that, on, on predicting whether it's going to snow down here or not, even though that's what most of you really want to know, isn't it? <laughs> Is it going to snow in the valley? That's the question I get all the time, and I've got an answer for you. Maybe. <laughs> you might as well flip a coin. You might as well flip a coin. You see, there, there are two kinds of forecasts. There are weather forecasts and climate forecasts. You know, weather is what you get and climate is what you're supposed to get, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to get. And I'll leave it up to Pete and others, too. Pete, you're going to, you're going to do a weather forecast, aren't you? <laughs> okay, well, never mind. <laughs> anyway, in terms of mountain snow, I think this is going to be a really good year for mountain snow. Um, these these years, uh, a couple of them started kind of slowly, but but I, I think I think things will really get cranked up in November. Um, this is cumulative precipitation for the entire entire Willamette Valley Climate Division. Here's the the average right here, and all four of those analog years were. <coughs> Well above average, and uh, 73, 74 was generally the, the wettest water you've ever seen in the uh, in the Northwest. But 70, 71 wasn't far behind. Uh, so it was a couple of very wet winters, and, uh, and that became a key part of my forecast. This is a, a really cool tool that the uh, Climate Diagnostic Center developed, and you you put in you put in different years, and this is October through March standardized temperature anomalies. So these are standard deviations. Basically, the, the, the blue is cool and the red and orange is warm. So, so based on the composite of those four years, uh, we see cool temperatures along the west coast. Again, that's it's classic La Nina. So I think it'll be, in, but not extreme cold. It's, it's actually down here pretty close to zero. So that indicates very wet and kind of cool. Um, and, and here's precipitation anomalies for those, those four winters, and it shows very wet and very dry here. Again, classic uh, La Nina pattern. This is just for the single year, 7071, and uh, with up to two standard deviations above average. And then, then what I did is I, I, I double weighted 70-71 and 73-74. I said, I, I really like those years better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double weight those. And when you do that, you get these pretty extreme wetness values here. So it, it all kind of kind of fits in together. So here's my bottom line. And, and, and this is the caveat, I think, at, at the top. This amazingly rapid transition is almost unprecedented. And frankly, that, that worries me a little bit because I have all these indicators, but then the fact that this thing is changing so fast um, means that maybe we're in territory that we haven't seen or haven't been able to identify. It'd rather be nine early season. I, I made a forecast back in, in August that we were going to have a very relatively warm and dry uh, early fall, September and October. And of course, we had some pretty heavy rain in September. And, I gave a talk for some farmers in September, and they said, I thought you said it was going to be dry in September. <laughs> I didn't say exactly dry, but I didn't think it was going to be that wet. But I, then they said, is winter here? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, October is going to be great. We even got up to 80 degrees in October. So. Um, but I think November is going to come along, and everything's going to change. And, and it's going to be like we drop off the table. Very active November through February, above average mountain snowfall for the winter, an average ski season opening date. In, in my experience, the, uh, the, the ski season is opened earlier in the El Ninos because of the really uh, active early season. The, at Mount Hood Meadows, the earliest they ever had was in 97, which was a huge El Nino, and then they barely made it through in the middle. Um, 
I think significant precipitation totals. Wet winter with better than even <coughs> chance of flooding. Average temperatures. I don't think this is going to be a really cold La Nina. This is going to be a busy, active, and there are going to be so many storms that it would keep the temperatures from getting too cold. Possible low elevation snow. Boy, there's a weasel word for you. <laughs> we study that in, in school and we study meteorology. How to speak in weasel words. So, uh, there's, there are my three, the three W's. Wet, windy, and wild. And that's what I think is going to happen. So, uh, that's it. Thank you. Southern California. Northern California. Oh, well, let, 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 me, let me tell you Southern California first. But that's where I'm from originally. The, the southern, the southern uh, half of California tends to have just the opposite signal to ours. Uh, they tend to be wet during El Nino's, dry during La Nina's, and we're the opposite. Um, Northern California and even Southern Oregon can go either way, and the signal is not really strong. It's, it's in the area where the correlations are not real high. So. Um, short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Signal's not very strong. Bob, you go ahead and pick up the question. Right here. Oh, oh that's just, I'm tagging a little bit onto what he said. Um, down in Southern California, it was a really strange summer. They basically had no summer. They're used to that June eddy. The June bloom June lasted bloom, all and summer in Southern California. And nothing it just didn't go away right. and so they had a pretty gloomy summer kind of like we did although I think it was September 28th they hit 113 that summer all in one day and so I was wondering if that if you can make any predictions from that just kind of a, an anomaly I don't I don't you the, the question was Southern California had a really unusually gloomy summer and do I use any of those in my predictions? And the, the answer is no. Uh, it's very difficult to predict summer conditions in advance. During the winter, you have uh, hemispheric-wide transport of, of air from the tropics to the poles. And this is what gives us our big storms. This is what creates a jet stream. But the whole northern hemisphere has a very active north to south circulation. And in our hemisphere, a northward transport of warm air and southward transport of cold air. In the summer, the temperature difference or gradient between the tropics and the poles is much smaller, so you have very little hemispheric interchange, and things are dominated by local conditions like ocean temperatures. So there's a, there's a real disconnect. But the, the fact that the circulation is so is such a such large scale in the winter gives us better predictive skill. Uh, and, and that's why the El Nino Southern Oscillation affects us in the winter, but it really doesn't affect us in the summer. Why don't you uh, ask, uh, identify some people in the back. Sure. Like well, that lady right there. Well, really here, here. Uh, well I, don't, I don't mean in a frivolous way, but half the dog in the bird. Anybody ever, like, measure that? I doesn't tell you when it's going to snow, but it might tell you. You know, uh, the, the question was, what about cats and dogs, and what do they tell you? Um, I, no, the fur. A what? How thick their fur is. I wrote, I wrote two books. This is not a plug for my books, but the Oregon Weather Book, published in 1999. Everyone should have a copy. <laughs> and you can get them really cheaply right now. I use them as low as 50 cents. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, there's a chapter in the Oregon Weather Book on using animals to predict the weather. And there's even one that ducks tell us, and there's one that beavers tell us. <laughs> uh, so anyway. Uh, and there's the fuzzy willy yeah. bear. The caterpillar. Yeah. yeah, but I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. Last one down here. So George, have you worked up a, have you worked up a La Nina song? I, I do have a La Nina song, and uh, I didn't bring my guitar. I really thought about it. 
I really thought about it, but um, it's it's done to the tune of Lola by the Kinks. <laughs> it's a pretty cool song, but I, I like the El Nino song better. Um, so I'll I'll wait till we have another El Nino, and then I'll bring my guitar. <laughs> Thank you, George. If I would have known that we would have had a flash in here, I would have not put it up yet, but uh, this is always one of the highlights of the winter weather meeting from the Department of Forestry and Meteorologist, Mr. Pete Parsons.